The revolution is here. A movement of people free to live, work, and choose. We won't tell you what to think. We just demand that you think for yourself. This is Kibbe on Liberty. Um, so we're, we're going to drink bourbon today, Brad. So don't, <laughs> don't judge. And, I'll be all right. And don't get upset. But if, if Hannah and I drink enough, bourbon perhaps you can be our designated podcaster and <laughs> like if we don't make we do enough more, designated driving for if we don't make sense he's definitely driving me home after this so 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 bourbon or rye Ooh, let's do bourbon i'm a kentucky girl so yeah you gotta, gotta stay true to my roots show the home team colors right last That's time right. i was here you gave me cold brew but that wasn't offered any today and i was a little <laughs> hurt i do have um it's called um Death Wish or something. Oh, wow. Which is supposedly the most highly mm. caffeinated cold coffee ever. Wow. Do you want to try one? I will have, to, after this, I'll have to try okay. some. That's quite the, that's quite the, uh, the hype over it. You're going to be so hype at the airport tonight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cheers. Cheers, Matt. Good to see you again. Brad. Cheers. To my water. <laughs> to we're, your water. We're not, we're not judging. We just sound like it. We... I really do love that you don't drink. It works out so well for me. Mm -hmm. A lot of my friends have said that over the years. Yeah, like um, you could probably have a side gig driving people around. <laughs> I could. could. I don't part. have the pay. I'm too antisocial for that, honestly. Yeah. I don't have the patience. <laughs> well, you could get one of those uh, New York cabbie things where you don't actually have to talk to the people you're driving around. That's a little depressing. Yeah. yeah. I miss that about New York City Ubers, though. Nobody expects you to carry on conversation when you're an Uber or a cab. And then down south, they want your whole life story. And I'm like, I just want to listen to my music and pretend I'm in a music video and ride and enjoy this. But Yeah, Uber drivers start, like, grilling me about politics, yeah. particularly when they find out you're from Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Oh, and no. And it's, it's kind of – it, and I, I usually make up a story like I'm in video production because I used to say I'm an economist and no one <laughs> actually wanted to talk to me then, but – that's but a I don't smart know. answer. Well, I if I say I'm a libertarian, they're always really curious. And then I feel like I, I have to do outreach, right? I have to evangelize and talk to them about libertarianism, but then it's work. And yeah. so yeah. it is always that struggle. So like I, um, I have no plans for today, and I definitely want to talk about your guys' new project-based politics, and um, that's basedpolitics.com. It's based-politics.com. Somebody was holding the basedpolitics.com hostage, and we didn't want to pay thousands of dollars for it. So yeah. Yeah. we compromised. Uh, URLs don't matter that much anymore. It's like the content that matters. But uh, we're definitely going to talk about that and what you guys are doing. But one thing I've never talked about on this show is sort of um, woke speech police. For for years, I was sort of avoiding it. I'm like, that's I, I thought it was silly. I thought it was annoying. But um, in the last couple months, the convergence of people that – uh, want to keep us locked down, people that want to force us all to be vaccinated, even if we have natural immunity, uh, people that don't want Joe Rogan to talk to people that disagree with those policies, and and traditional wokeism, it's all turned into this ugly blob. So I, I feel like I'm sort of red-pilled now, not in the political sense, but in the actual matrix sense of like, wow, the machine really doesn't want me to think for myself anymore. Well, COVID has to have that effect, right? Because they went overboard on, uh, they were already, you know, cracking down on dissent and purging people, but this gave them the perfect excuse to say it's an emergency, drastic yeah. times call for drastic measures or misinformation, it kills people. And what's interesting to me is how paternalistic the, the censor's mindset is in all of this. It's like, to argue that Joe Ro I don't think Joe Rogan does spew misinformation, but even if he did, he is not responsible for other people's decisions simply because they listened to information that was presented on his show. It's like they, those people still have agency. Yeah. And that's what a lot of this uh, censorship culture is, is very paternalistic. Yeah, it's definitely paternalistic. I feel like I'm like you, Matt. I'm getting kind of red-pilled. I'm somebody who's done a lot of work with the left, and oftentimes when I see people talk about people being woke, I don't I don't find it helpful all the time because I'm trying to reach those people, and I think if you're just condemning them and putting them in a bucket, that's not how you actually get in front of them and get them to care. But this Joe Rogan thing is under my skin. It really makes me angry when you see the machine starting to work and come together, and when you recognize that when one tactic doesn't work, then they move over here and they try this tactic, and it's like they'll do anything to ultimately try to shut him down when and what that really says is they can't defend their views, they can't defend their beliefs, they can't debate, and because they can't, they instead want to silence people. And I just find that ultimately infuriating and really concerning because thankfully Spotify is thus far 
mostly standing by him. They did delete some of his episodes, I noticed, over the past day or so. But they're mostly standing by him. But if it keeps going, it keeps going. For how long do they continue to take those stances? We also see them going after Substack, which I think has had a great stance on free speech. And, And that's all of this is one reason Brad and I felt really strongly in creating base politics, because we know that ultimately we're pretty... Um, milk toast people when it comes to like what we actually say online. We're not antagonistic. We're a little careful, right? We're careful. Because we but, rely on those platforms. Right. And that's just not my nature. I'm not really a stone thrower. But at the end of the day, we could be removed at any moment and all of a sudden lose access to these tens of thousands of followers we've built up who want to hear our message. So creating a place that we actually own for content to live and for people to find us, I think has become increasingly important in this day and age. Yeah, that's my backstop as well. Like Blaze TV co-publishes this show. And and one of the attractive parts of that is like they can't cancel me. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could, but um, I don't think they will because the whole agreement is we're I'm I'm free to say whatever I want. It's the one place where me is sort of the the I'm I'm at the margin of Blaze TV. I'm the libertarian. Right. And Eric July is the other libertarian. And um, so far, no one's ever said, don't say that, don't say this. And and I'm kind of a nutty libertarian. I say crazy things. So. Well, but we're all sort of fortunate that we have the backings of some of these companies and platforms. We know a lot of people in our space that are pretty aligned with where Brad and I are ideologically, and they don't have those kinds of jobs. And so they end up going and either working for people who are much further to the right of them, or they don't have jobs, or they're boxed in at the companies where they're working and they're only allowed to talk but about certain things. they have to leave politics things. and they have to go do other stuff. And so part of what we want to do is bring in other people who don't have a home. I mean, for people who think like us and believe in freedom, still believe in limited government and capitalism and all these things that are increasingly... That's crazy. I know. (laughs) But they're increasingly out of favor on the progressive left long ago, but then also on the populist, nationalist right. It's like, where's the home for the next generation of talent in this space? We need one. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm very much in the ecumenical libertarian camp. Like, I, I think I would cast a very broad net as to who that includes, and that I think the counter-revolution of sort of this woke intolerant speech police stuff is um, like I, I wouldn't consider a woke progressive to be a liberal in any sense. No. Um, just intolerance, um, not wanting you to think for yourself. Um, and certainly there's elements of that on the national right as well. By the way, that's probably Joe Biden flying <laughs> by. We, hey always, Joe. we always acknowledge when either squirrels run across the roof or Joe Biden flies by. but. Um, I think that there is a counter-revolution, um, going back to my matrix metaphor, um, and the first step is to realize that the machine doesn't want you to think for yourself. And there's a lot of vested interests, certainly government interests, but I think private interests as well, that, that love controlling the narrative from the top down. And, and I think a lot of the chaos over the last um, five, ten years, I could go all the way back to the pre-Tea Party Maybe even go all the way back to Howard Dean when he had like 10 minutes of threatening the Democratic <laughs> establishment. Um, that's That to me is people realizing that the system failed, the system lied. Um, you can't necessarily trust the experts. And I think that's a very healthy thing. Like I, I think this is like the libertarian moment that we've all been talking about. I think it is, but I think this that what we're witnessing right now is like the establishment's fight back. So why are they going after Joe Rogan? It's not because of what he said on a couple of controversial guests he had on COVID. It's because Joe Rogan averages 11 million listeners an episode. Right. CNN is lucky to get 500,000 to 1 million during an evening broadcast. Even Fox is lucky to get 2 or 3 million in a primetime broadcast. So Fox isn't canceling Joe Rogan, but just to put his numbers in context... The establishment media is threatened by him, and then they seek other avenues to try to shut him down or crack him down. Same way, why is it that the New York Times is always agitating for more censorship on Facebook, and their liberal media outlets are always running pieces about how dangerous unfettered speech is on Substack? It's because it threatens their um, monopoly hold on information, and it threatens their financial interests to have people speak out. Yeah, and not only that, I've been saying this to a bunch of libertarian conventions over the past couple months when I've been speaking, there has never been a better time 
to organize, to connect with people who think like you, to educate people who are maybe close but don't know how to get involved. I've been in politics full time since 2016 and been able to get an incredible amount done because of this age of information, because of those connectivity tools. And what we're seeing is a fall of the power apparatus, right, where they've had all of this in lockstep for decades and decades and decades. And first the media kind of started to crumble. Now the organizing capabilities are starting to crumble. And I also think within COVID, you see the masses starting to wake up. I think a lot of people are discouraged by what's going on, and I understand that. But I'm kind of pumped because I see these people that were on the sidelines up until right. a year or two ago suddenly becoming radicalized, especially when it comes to things like school choice. When I was doing school choice in Tennessee in 2016 and 2017, the only people we could get to show up at the Capitol were people who were in communities where they knew that they weren't getting educational access and had been fighting for this for decades. But white America, a lot of the Republican districts, they were quiet on it. They didn't show up. Now that has radically changed. We've been telling people, go to your school boards. That's where the fight is. That's where the real locus of control is. And they're doing it. And they're doing at such levels that you see the federal government coming in and labeling them terrorists because they're so threatened by the fact that parents are finally getting involved in the educational process. So I feel like this is a great time for us as libertarians, as people who hold these views, to actually go out and organize and start to fight back. And they know it. This is like the, the last screaming kind of death of this whole power apparatus. Yeah, they're like, uh, yes, we said democracy, but not the kind of democracy <laughs> where people participate in the right. political process in the public square because... That's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Not you can't where you're actually paying attention. States do different things. Yeah. I mean, this is like I was just writing about the Biden stimulus legislation. They literally put a provision in there that states can't cut their own taxes if they take the federal bailout money. And it's like the more and more that you centralize control in a federal government where Texas doesn't get to be Texas and California doesn't get to be California, the more apocalyptic our political levels will get, the more we'll hate each other, the more we'll fight for control over every few years. And I wish that people, I think people are, like you're mentioning, realizing how important local government is, but we also have to make sure it stays important. Yeah, yeah. This is Mike Lee's point. He, he's the, the ultimate federalist, Senator Mike Lee, um, has pointed out that, you know, the um, he looks at impeachment data because the, there's an escalating number of impeachments happening. It used to be an incredibly rare thing. And then the more power got centralized in Washington, D.C., the stakes were higher. So the party in power impeaches the other guy and vice versa. And, and God knows how many times we're going to impeach Joe Biden before we're done. And, and will he know right, well, he if he notice. gets impeached? But, but it, it's, it's all about centralized power. And it, it leads to, you know, I hate all the rhetoric about civil war. And I don't think America's on the verge of civil war. But this idea that you're going to get your team in power to impose your values and your religious views and your fill in the blank on the other guys, well, why wouldn't they fight back? Like you can imagine, like you're, you're seeing this happen, um, particularly with lockdowns. And I'm, I'm thinking about the Canadian truckers in particular, <laughs> like, yeah. and, and the, the reaction, and, and this is true in Nova Scotia, I think it's happening all over Canada, but in Nova Scotia, the government used the emergency powers that they declared because of COVID to ban people from protesting the policies that they've implemented under emergency powers, policy, powers under COVID. And I'm like, wow, that's so Orwellian. It and is. no wonder, like, I would be surprised if people get pissed. Well, and I'm also very sympathetic to the idea that it's not just governments, but governments coercing, I mean, colluding with businesses. So in the case of GoFundMe, the Canadian government said, hey, take that money away, people are fundraising for the protesters, and they complied and they did it, and they worked with them to uh, actually t try to redistribute that money people had donated for the truckers. That's very disturbing to me, even as somebody who's generally you know, pro markets and business, when they start colluding with government to do things, when the government starts calling on Spotify to censor Joe Rogan, yeah. like the White House has done in implicit, but there, uh, terms on a couple of occasions now. It was, it was pretty explicit. Yeah. yeah. Well, so the first time they were asked about it, they just kind of said, well, they should do more to crack down on misinformation. And it wasn't super explicit that they were saying Joe Rogan. The second time was much more explicit. Yeah. Um, and I think it was the Surgeon General who said something like, yeah, he should be. <laughs> That's really disturbing to me. That crosses a bright red line. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, I've talked a lot, we economists talk about regulatory capture, where big corporations use the system to create so many rules that the upstart competitors can't get into the system. This is sort of, some. it's the same thing, but it's different because it's more like political capture. 
if the president's press secretary says you should do something about Joe Rogan, it's kind of an offer you can't refuse. Right. Well, I've been covering antitrust a lot lately, and I've gotten so hype on this issue because you start to see how they get around the Constitution because they don't have to come in and actually censor free speech. They don't have to pass a law or actually pa- put a regulation in place. If they did, the company could sue and ultimately win in the courts because there would be a First Amendment violation because they threaten and say, if you don't do this, we might look at you know regulation, we might look at antitrust, we might look at reforming Section 230. That then pushes the company to go ahead and then do the unconstitutional act but there's nothing to actually hang our hats on and go after them for. And so we continue to see these old schemes that we've had for decades that have never been pro-capitalist actual ideas be used in this way to continue to thwart the market and also hurt consumers. And one thing that's happening right now that just grinds my gears is you continue to see people on both the left and right wanting to expand these kind of schemes, right? And really riling people up and saying, see, you need government to intervene and break up companies instead of saying, no, we need to go after the government and, and check them with our power of checks and balances as Congress and actually get the government under control and prevent them from doing this. But you don't see that effort among the right. And so I think that's a real concern when you see both the left and right starting to collude in this way and then companies kind of falling under mm-hmm. their purview. And it's interesting too because part of what we're doing at base politics is we're all about free market economics. But there's this kind of misconception um, that people who believe in free market capitalism are pro business or pro big business. We're really not. We're right. pro free market and big business and big government tend to be in bed together and to have quite the loving relationship. So I'm fine with like I think Amazon is a really good example. Amazon does a lot of great things. For, it, it gives millions of people products at the tip of their fingers delivered super quickly for affordable prices. Like we take a lot for granted about how amazing Amazon can be and Bezos only got so rich in part by providing value to a lot of people. At the same time, Bezos and Amazon lobby for a $15 minimum wage because they know they can afford it, but it will bankrupt the small businesses that still compete with them. They lobby for corporate tax hikes because they know they can bear the burden, but smaller companies that are trying to catch up to them can't. So at the same time that we are pro-free markets, we can't be pro-big business like the GOP has historically been because that is a recipe that people aren't interested in because crony capitalism is really rampant and rife here and we can't fall into the trap of thinking that we have to defend that or that that's what free markets look like. And to add to that, you also have this history of governments giving these companies bailouts, economic development, money to open offices. So when you look at some of these companies that they then want to target with their right hand, it's like, well, you prop them up with your left hand. They never got that big organically or on their own and creative destruction in an actual free market system would ensure they never stayed dominant in that way. So again, if we're worried about these companies getting too big, if we're worried about them colluding with government, the locus of, of attention needs to be where it's actually occurring, which is when we're initially propping them up and giving them all this crony kind of handouts under government. Yeah, it, it's like a delicate um, balance. And I, I think a lot of libertarians get confused because some people, some libertarians, some free marketeers have this sort of knee jerk, it's a private company, can do what it wants, um, which is true. Mm-hmm. But when you start sort of unwrapping the, the collusion between these companies and government, I think it gets a little more complicated. I'm thinking back to um, years and years ago, I'm dating myself, um, which will alienate your young audience, but um, when we were fighting over internet taxes, um, Amazon was on the front lines opposing internet taxes um, because it was in their company's best interest. And then they developed the tax software that would um, that they wanted to sell to all these small companies to comply with uh, 50 different sets of, of rules, and they flipped overnight. <laughs> and suddenly they were pro-internet taxes. I think the same thing with the minimum wage. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to sort of um, create a cartel, uh, very much in, in collusion with government. So I've, I've been very willing to criticize big tech for bad behavior. I don't, I don't think giving Elizabeth Warren the power to regulate them <laughs> is a good idea. And I remember like uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, probably two years ago now was testifying and, and both the Republicans and the Democrats were beating him up because he wasn't doing this, he wasn't doing that. And he said quite explicitly, um, meet with my team of lobbyists and lawyers and I'll help you write the regulations to censor speech. I'm like, that's what there they do, right? It is what they do. Yeah. 
they're spending millions right now. If you and I listen to a lot of um, things on the left on the New York Times every day on their podcast. Facebook's on there advocating for Section 230 reform. So all these all these conservatives and libertarians are getting hoodwinked when they're being told like we're going to go in and crush these big tech companies by reforming Section 230. No, they're literally lobbying for it. They yeah. want it too because yeah. they know they can crush their competitors. They'll actually be able to censor speech more if you get rid of Section 230 or reform it. And people continue to really get played by their government because they don't learn to actually look at the root cause of problems or actual economics at play. But it's, it's pretty simple. If you look at who wants the regulations, it's usually the people that most people on the right consider their enemies that they actually want to get under control, but they're they're being tricked. Yeah. So like it's it's sort of a form of whack-a-mole because the, the, the machine, it used to be old legacy media and now it's tech. And the more that these tools that we're so optimistic about democratize knowledge and information and decentralize everything, the more hysterical the, the response is. And, and I'm, I'm thinking back to your platform. One of the things we've talked about at Free the People is, um, what do we do if they pull our servers? <laughs> Which is now a thing. It has happened mm-hmm. to Parler. You never ever would think about that. And, and it's like, surely, um, if you were big enough to fight them, you, you could take on Amazon on such a thing, but most of us are not. Mm-hmm. Um, so like you have to keep thinking about how, how am I going to protect my platform because if they kick me off of YouTube um, and I go back to my platform and my platform gets Joe Rogan size, which I'm sure you guys will, like you guys are going to be huge. Oh, that's a pretty um, big goal. Amaz- I hope so. Amazon is going to pull the plug. What are you going to do about that? Right. I think it's a really valid concern. And I think one thing that encourages me is we're starting to see people who do have the resources to really fight back at that level wake up. I've loved watching the progression of Elon Musk recently, for one example of, of many. Um, if he's like R- Russell Brand, you have all these people that were kind of associated with the left who in the past two years are starting to stand up and speak out. It really does give you like Atlas Shrug kind of vibes, right? Yeah, Where yeah. they're like, no more. I'm John Galt. You're not doing this anymore. And those kinds of people can have the money and resources to start actually creating new platforms, new resources. And I hope that that's where it goes. Um, this is a bit off topic, but I love seeing like Mark Cuban right now. He just started this new pharmacy that he's pioneering that's cutting out the insurance Very- Intrigued by that, cutting yeah. out the middlemen, the PBMs that make drugs so expensive. He says, no more. I'm starting my own thing. We're going to have price transparency. He's getting more done with starting that company than 10 years of lobbying the government to fix the drug market could ever do. We need titans of industry, business people to rise up. And the thing is, most of them know these things. They know what the government's doing. And for too long, they've just kind of folded and they've played the game. And I get it, right? They've played the game to get ahead. Their main goal is to make money and to provide the product that their consumers want. But once you hit this pinnacle, it's time to start getting involved and actually building these institutions that we need. So I'm hoping that we see more energy directed that way. We're doing it at the level that we can. You know, we're working nights and weekends to get this off the ground. We saw a need, not just for ourselves, but for others. We have so many friends out there who either don't have a platform to go to to really talk about the true free market, limited government, individual liberty ideas they hold, or they're currently working within the movement in some app in some faction, but they're actually still being kind of censored. They can't talk about everything they want to say, or they can't say it the way they want to say it. We're trying to build and provide that platform for others, but we also need other people to come alongside us and give us the tools to build an even bigger infrastructure that can guard against some of this, because we know it's not going to stop. The people, the Karens, I like to call them on the left, that are increasingly trying to go after every platform that has free expression and open ideas, they're Karens. not going to back down, right? They're not going to back down. They've got a lot of energy, right? They're sitting at home, they're bored, they're going to keep going going for these platforms so we've got to build these things. I also think, and this is again a little tangent, but I've become a little bit of a Bitcoin bug lately. <laughs> and I've started to go down the crypto rabbit hole. And mm-hmm. I know, I'm sure you know this, but people that don't know this, the great thing about Bitcoin is that no one controls it. It's not like a new company where um, instead of Twitter, we have Parler who is centralized and in charge. And we hope that they will be better. In fact, the thing about Bitcoin is the network is decentralized, so it can't be inflated. The amount's going to stay consistent as what it is, and no one person has control over it, but rather thousands or maybe millions of people do. I actually, and that's leading to something that's called decentralized finance. Mm -hmm. There's actually a lot of thought that you could end up with platforms that are decentralized and structured. Maybe the next big social media thing will be something that isn't owned by any one company, but is part of a blockchain or a massive network. And I'm not a huge tech person, so I'm stretching the boundaries of my knowledge here. But I actually think 
there's enough appetite out there for people in the world who are sick of this, who are yeah. sick of this censorship and who are sick of approved narratives only. They've seen them fall apart before their eyes over the last few years. And so I think there's if, if markets have a tendency when there is an unfilled market need to find a way. Now, governments make it very hard sometimes. Incumbents make it very hard sometimes. But I'm actually optimistic. Nobody could have seen TikTok coming 15 years ago if you told them what TikTok was uh, or 20 years ago. Nobody would have ever understood what a phenomenon that could become. I think the next big thing could be something decentralized to yeah. get around this system. I have a, I have a buddy who is uh, a bona fide coder cryptocurrency blockchain guy and he's going to come on and do sort of crypto 101 and then blockchain 101 because I I'm I'm an economist I understand Hayek I understand the theory of everything you're talking about but um, I do think that there is probably a blockchain solution to this and and the incumbents are doing themselves a horrible disservice by pushing everybody to desperately find that that free place and and I I can't wait, but in the meantime, we gotta we gotta sort of we're, yeah. we're all in the business of of um, I don't know what we're in the business of talking and educating and <laughs> advocacy, spreading uh, ideas, ideas, and in, engaging people, and that's precisely what they're fighting against right now because they're like we didn't mean for those guys to succeed on this platform, mm -hmm. meaning the Liberty guys. Um, they wanted they wanted to uh, to keep centralizing everything. That's right. And I think I love this one quote. I can't remember who said it, but it says that words are powerful. They deserve respect. If you get the right ones in the right order, you can move the world a bit. And it's absolutely true. Ideas are so powerful. And when it comes to us, I think our ideas are the most powerful because they're right. And I've seen this time and time again where I've gone in, I've lobbied on issues, I've worked on certain bills, and I've always been able to win because the arguments are stacked against the other side. I would go to I would go to other ideas if they were the actual ones that held value, but they're not. Our ideas are actually where you see the proof in the pudding. You see massive growth, innovation, you see people come out of poverty, you see the world get better. And so I think when we have a platform to get that in front of people, it's dangerous to people who have other incentives or who are pursuing other ideas. So I I still feel energized because I think, like Brad said, the market will rise and it might be difficult and we might have to go through some fights, but I have no doubt that we will continue to see people innovate despite the government, despite regulations, come up with new ideas, new platforms. I'm also energized by Bitcoin. Uh, side note, I have been doing a lot of advocacy for Julian Assange. I'm very pas passionate about him and his case and, and free speech that's at stake there. And his brother reached out to me after I did a Kennedy clip recently talking about this. And they're using Bitcoin to start fundraising for him to fund his defense where governments can't take that money and get a hold of it. So like, there's so much power and potential in that area that just gets me really excited. I mean, really a great example we already talked about is the Canadian truckers. Yeah. yeah. Well, they've now started a new fundraiser through crypto, decentralized, that guess what? No corporation in cahoots with the government can take away. Literally, even if the government tried to make crypto illegal, they couldn't really stop it from existing and spreading and being used, yeah. which is one of the most fascinating things about it. Yeah, I don't want to let GoFundMe off the hook because I feel like what they did, I have no idea what their terms of service are, but you know, stealing money doesn't seem oh it's fraud like, like it a should, good business it arguably model. and i'm not a lawyer seems criminal to me like to, like almost fraud to, yeah. to go to that yeah. level of they were considering at one point like giving the money to different causes that they picked that's fraud and one you know another one of my uh, crypto savvy friends said of gofundme that day okay this is the beginning of the end of your business model because without trust you have nothing and you're forcing people to move to a crypto-based model because the the overlords, whoever they are, and and I, I don't trust the good guy overlords any more than the bad guy overlords because power corrupts people. But mm -hmm. but I, I think that's that's a beautiful thing, and it kind of gets back to this this ridiculous debate we're having about free speech and everything's inverted. Where um, um, particularly the left now is saying, well, of course I'm for free speech, but not. That speech, not really. Like, what is what does that even mean? Yeah, well, I mean, Matt, you know this, and, and I think that anybody in the advocacy space knows it. But for a lot of people on the right, they've been taught that the ACLU is bad, they're dangerous, they're super left wing, and increasingly that's true. 
But if you really dig back into the legal history of this country, the ACLU was this massive stalwart that we, I really don't think, would have the civil liber- liberties we have to this day were it yeah. not for their advocacy. They did such important work when it came to civil liberties, which I love free markets. I love capitalism, but civil liberties are my top thing. And so I've, I've really been impressed as I've dug in more over the years to all they did. And we see them folding. Right. We, we no longer see them when it comes to this real test of free speech, which is being attacked on all fronts right now. They're nowhere to be found. I don't know what they're off doing, but they're certainly not out here defending free speech. And the thing with free speech that is so critical is that in order to actually defend it, you have to usually defend people you don't like, people whose views you abhor, things you detest. You know, I can't think of anything that grosses me out more than the alt-right kind of white nationalist thing, which we've seen a bunch of because they are high-key mad that we are using the word based and and making it more popular than they ever did. Um, So we've been getting trolled and attacked by them nonstop, and they write some really vile, gross things in our comments and just have some views that are really abhorrent. But I'll go to bat for their freedom to say that every day, all day. And I hope in that process that they see that stand and and realize that this is a person of character who will stand up for me and hopefully change their ways because of it. But we do not actually end those kinds of gross thoughts by trying to censor them or shut them down. We win by debating them, by defending their ability to say it, and honestly confronting them with better ideas and better facts. The left has lost the plot on that entirely. And I also, I feel a little vindicated. I did a little victory uh, (laughs) victory lap recently because... It was back in 2018, I think, or several years ago now, when Alex Jones was purged from all the social media platforms at once. And let me be clear, I think he's a nut job, not a fan at all. But I wrote at the time, USA Today op-ed, saying that it won't stop with Alex Jones. Mm -hmm. It's going to start with Alex Jones, and then it's going to be somebody still very fringe and crazy, but a little less, and it's going to keep creeping to the middle, to the middle. Now you have somebody like Joe Rogan, who is literally on the left, center left. He's just kind of a dissident guy who talks to a lot of different people. Um, and then you have extremely mainstream people getting hit with censorship. And, and, and now even uh, all, I, I had a video um, on TikTok, which, to be fair, what do you expect? It's owned by the Communist Party of China. But I had a video making the most milquetoast defense of Kyle Rittenhouse that the jury of his peers in our legal system agreed. He was, you know, not a wise kid, shouldn't have been there most likely. But he's defended himself. And as a matter of law, I think the jury reached the right verdict. They suspended it. I, I was locked out of my account. I appealed it. They, they rejected my appeal. Now, I was able to throw a fit about it on Twitter and like tag them and I have a blue check or whatever. So they actually reversed it for me. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking about that. How many thousands of people posted similar content and had it taken down and didn't have the microphone or the recourse to go get that reversed? Probably a lot. And so even very boilerplate opinions and arguments that are literally f- found by a jury uh, are, are now beyond the pale. And so that shows you why you do have to stand in the gap for people you don't like and for people who are crazy, um, even people who are vile, uh, because it won't stop there. And not only that, but your account has actually never recovered. Well, so they gave you your account back, but to this day, it's throttled. The views are never been the same. Man. It went from like hundreds of thousands yeah. or tens of thousands to like single digit hundreds of views on the videos. Mm-hmm. So now I use a different account, but I, I, I do think that's funny. <laughs> it's it's kind of um, not shocking that the Chinese government has a particular issue with the Second Amendment. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, given Actually, that. a CCP official literally just gave a speech about how America is yeah. killing people with the Second Amendment. And I wrote an article about this. I was like, thank you for proving our point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, of course you don't like the Second Amendment. We're not surprised. Of course, we're not allowed to talk about the Tiananmen Square massacre either. And and what's what's shocking, and I'm going to go down this rabbit hole, but having spent some time looking at the history not only of uh, Chinese experiments in communism, but every single experiment in communism, you realize, and it's particularly pronounced in the in the Chinese model, they do not care about individuals. They view individuals as part of a, a collective mass of of things that move around and do things and, and produce um, value for the state, um, which explains the Tiananmen Square massacre. And, and for people who haven't gone back and, and read what actually happened there, um, they, they just slaughtered a bunch of kids. Mm-hmm. And it was it was worse, perhaps, than what would happen at a slaughterhouse where you're processing hamburger. Um, so, like, this, this is the teachable moment for the Second Amendment, uh, but it's also sort of a teachable moment for free speech, the, the Chinese model, um, and this is why I've gotten so red-pilled, um, think about the Chinese social credit system, 
which as it turns out is not a government system. It is a government controlled system that is implemented by private companies in, in the Chinese system. And um, yes, they do vaccine passports, but they do everything else. Right. There's a whole matrix of good citizen, bad citizen. And if you do not meet their standard, they shut off your bank account. Mm -hmm. you, you lose your own money, can't feed your family. I don't know what happens. I mean, maybe you maybe you eventually go to some struggle session and get your access to some of your money back. And I don't want to be alarmist because I don't think we're close to that yet, but we're definitely slowly ebbing in that direction. I'll give you an example. Michelle Malkin, who I think has gone off the rails. I think she's gone into some very dangerous territory, some crazy stuff she says these days. But she was actually recently, her and her husband, banned from using Airbnb because of their views being crazy or whatever. Like that is a very dangerous track to go down right. where all of a sudden people who are too problematic can't rent an apartment or a home through a totally apolitical service ostensibly. And I'm very concerned to see us going that path. But on the China question, I will say I have very little. I get frustrated with Americans who don't appreciate our values because I had a close friend in college who was an international student from China. And she came to the U.S. and we were in a club together. So we traveled around the country or New England region. And I just watched her be stunned by things. The first time we went into a gas station, she was just like, wow, there are so many choices. She was used to having one chocolate bar kind with the official like party stamp or whatever on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And here there's 50 to choose from. She, the first time she found out Americans can own guns, she was in disbelief. She was like, if you work for the government. And I was like, no, anyone can. If the government gives you permission. In the right city. <laughs> and I was like, well, a little bit, but basically you can still own it. And she was like, wow, that is amazing. And she was taken aback. She was yeah. stunned. And yeah. she literally just nonchalantly told me, yeah, I know what things I can't post on Facebook while my family's still in China. Wow. Because right. they might disappear. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, I mean, people got to stop taking things for granted that we have here. But See, you but are right that we are not anywhere close to that. But I do think when you bring up the individual liberty and like this idea of upholding those values, we see a real push against it from both the left and right, especially under COVID where people are being browbeaten for having the audacity to care about themselves more than the collective good, right? Where you're constantly being told you're selfish, you're a bad person if you're not falling in line and wearing a mask because it makes that person feel better, even though there's no value to wearing a mask if it's a cloth mask, right? You see that over and over and over. And on the right, you honestly see this rise of people I see saying we need to do these things for the collective good, right? We need to actually use the government to come in and, and set social policy because it's for the, it's for the collective good. And both well, sides, the common good, the common good right? But that's collective. Like that is collectivism at its core. And I think that we do see a good portion of this country that wants to move away from our values of individual liberty and push us more into the system and are cons consistently trying to put down the notion that you as an individual should get to care about yourself first, should get to care about your family first, should get to actually make decisions for yourself. And that's, that is dangerous because it does lead to that ultimately. So we're a long right. way away from it, but the beginnings of it are happening. And if you don't stand up now, we do get there pretty quickly. I don't think we're that far away from it because I, I hadn't heard the Airbnb story, but I, I recall other um, politically unacceptable companies being debanked mm -hmm. um, where they uh, – was it the MyPillow guy? Did he get debanked? I don't know. But I remember Bank of America was pushing to, like, take the NRA out of their system for a yeah. while there. So you're right. There has been a good push towards And it's that. like um, – to, to me, like the infrastructure of vaccine passports, um, you, you can just add things to that. And why I've been like just adamantly, almost like tinfoil hat screaming about vaccine passports, I don't think it's about vaccination at all. I think it's about the infrastructure of the government deciding whether or not you're a good citizen. Like think about this in, in the District of Columbia, if you're black and unvaccinated, the mayor has decided that you don't get to go to a restaurant. Like, who had that on their dance card? Like, mm -hmm. this, this it's terrible. It's like it's like bizarre, and and people unaware of our own history of of the civil rights movement, of civil liberties, of of the American model itself. Um, and I think it's I think it's just a slippery slope that like if if we're going to decide whether or not. Um, you can use Spotify if we're going to decide whether or not you can use um, GoFundMe, um, Airbnb, 
um, access to a bank. I mean, mm-hmm. pretty soon they, they can shut down your life. And they have, right? In D.C., I was at a protest with Senator Rand Paul. Thomas Massey came last week with this restaurant here, a big board, who yeah. was not enforcing the vaccine passports, and they were sending undercover people in and spying on them, I guess. This is a veteran-owned business. They came in, and they physically shut them down. They put people out of work because they weren't showing and listen, I've been in D.C. for the past week. I can tell you firsthand what a joke it is. I am vaccinated, but I have taken great pleasure in ever using my real vaccine card. One time when push came to shove, I was going to be locked out of a music festival. I was out with a bunch of friends out of town. And so I made a fake one on my phone really fast. And I've been showing that all over <laughs> D.C. this week. And literally nobody cares. It is a Google image that has my name drawn in from Instagram. Nobody cares. <laughs> this is a joke of a system. Yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. And yet they're taking away people's livelihoods over this. I think that's gross. I think that it actually is racist when you look at the number of people of color who are not vaccinated, who have valid concerns, given the history of this country and how we have yeah, medically why, why tested they trust them. the government? Right. I can't imagine why. Shocker. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And yet right. they're getting pushed out of work, pushed out of society because they're not showing the stupid piece of paper. I went to New York City, too. And the thing that bugs me about the uh, vaccine passport system, uh, especially the government mandated one, but in general as well, um, is that it's not. I would have a problem with it no matter what, right? Just on principle. But it's also useless in accomplishing nothing, which makes it all the more gross that they're invading us like this for literally no achievement. Because in New York City, they have this. It's required by the government. Uh, anyone over age five has to show their paper. So l- kids can't go in a restaurant, a coffee shop, anything. They're locked out of most of the city's public venues if they don't have if they don't show their papers. But it's such a joke. These most of these restaurants obviously don't want to be enforcing it, so they just they're supposed to look at your ID, but only like two places I went actually looked at my ID. Most of them just quick glance at your card. I could show them a woman's name or I could show them my boyfriend's card. Like it doesn't matter. They're just complying. So with that in mind, a, we know the vaccines, uh, I do believe they protect you from serious illness or death, but they clearly don't stop transmission much at all. Uh, so you're not really accomplishing much in the first place. But even if creating a vaccinated only space did have scientific merit, I'm not a scientist, so I won't say one way or the other for sure. It's clearly not an effective system to do that. So it adds insult to injury when yeah. they are slapping you in the face and violating your privacy and your rights. Even though they know it's not there, it's not really accomplishing anything. They're more just doing it to make the point. We can control you if we want mm-hmm. to. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of torn on this because uh, on the one hand, I'm sympathetic to businesses that feel like they have no choice. Right. And you look at what happened to the big board. They, the, the moment that he expressed a public opinion against the machine, they started sending in the regulators and writing mm-hmm. him up. And, and eventually they took away his liquor license and then they just shut him down. But as someone that lives in the district, I am boycotting restaurants and I just switched my gym from D.C. Nice. I love the fact that I wasn't allowed to go to the gym. Right. <laughs> the be, one thing for, that would keep you safe, my, actually. For my health. But yeah. now, now, I go, now I drive to Virginia to go to the gym. And I feel like, it kind of kind of going back to the truckers, like at some point it needs to be safe for businesses to say hell no. Mm-hmm. And somebody's got to go first. And frankly, if, if enough of other restaurants had joined Big Board, yes. yeah. this wouldn't have happened in the first place. So um, I am boycotting restaurants in D.C., it's probably not their fault, but at the same time, if they don't rise up, this right. becomes normal. Yes, we were talking about this over the past week with a certain senator, and, and I think we all feel strongly that they can go after one person and pick them off. But if 10, 15, 50 businesses just organizing got together, they couldn't do that. And secondarily, the businesses are who have something to sue over. I cannot go file a lawsuit over this, but if I was a business owner, I could. And enough is enough. It's time for the businesses to actually start rallying together and suing over this. We need pro bono litigation. We need to start setting precedent and push back on this. And it actually I, it makes me mad. I feel sorry for business owners, and yet I also think they have a responsibility to stand up against this. And so I get a bit irritated when they aren't, right? Yeah. Sometimes when we're boycotting, right. it's not hitting the locus. I have, of, I have mixed the feelings on it, though, because like I went to New York City last week for work, and I was going to be there for several days. And I have tried to avoid D.C. because I, I live out in Virginia. We try not to really go in there unless we have to because we don't want to support this. Um, but that does mean we're punishing businesses who are being coerced. They're not doing this because they want to. And in New York City, for example, like all these restaurants I wanted to, I, I went to, hey, what was I supposed to do, like pack sandwiches for the <laughs> week? Um, but also, um, I, should I be boycotting them? 
but then I see on the other side that you're right. If I'm going to sound like I'm talking pro unionization, which is rare, but like if a hundred of these restaurant owners formed a little pack and told Mayor Bowser, we're not doing this, she can't shut down a hundred restaurants. But we actually have seen some, and listen, I'm not anti union. I'm anti how the unions function in this country because they usually use government to force people into membership and try to like take out contracting and, and things like that. I'm anti public sector. I'm anti public sector unions, demolish them immediately. But as a whole, <laughs> I'm not anti union unions and we have seen this effectively done where I believe it's been some police unions some postal office unions have actually organized and pushed back on some of these mandates effectively so that they get these exemptions in certain cities. But of course it's the government employees of that course are doing it. Is. it. Right. We need that for the actual we private We need the people. actual energy in the private sector. So yeah I'm, we're conflicted on this. We've talked about it a good bit. I think that it's fine to boycott but that only goes so far when it's not the restaurants mostly choosing to do this. It's not the businesses mostly choosing to do it. It is the government and that's where we're ultimately I think we need to take But you do concern. by boycotting innocent businesses hurt the government in a way because Mayor Bowser is direct indirectly feeling the pain when businesses in her city are suffering and tax revenue goes down and business owners are complaining to her so it's it's messy Mm -hmm. it's the only way to get to her so we were at the big board Logan and Terry and I were at the big board I missed you I had to leave the night that Rand and Thomas were there I guess you were upstairs no I left early I had another dinner I had to get to um and it's it's the first time I've actually been excited to be at a drive bar in my entire life (laughs) <laughs> um, but it, it felt like it was it was worth doing, and, and we had no idea that they were going to shut it down that night. Um, I want to talk about one final thing, and then then we'll then we'll tell everybody where they can check out your your guys' new project. But uh, one thing I've observed, and I've had a hard time explaining this, but with the vaccine mandate and with the mask mandate, they've inverted responsibility for your health. So it's no longer it's no longer what I eat. It's no longer how I behave. It's no longer whether or not I'm taking care of myself. My health is your responsibility. So if you're not wearing a mask, I am at risk. If you're not vaccinated, I'm at risk. It has nothing to do with whether or not I got vaccinated or I'm wearing a mask or if I I am I have um, uh, an immunocompromised system. Am I taking measures to protect myself and? And the story I tell, um, true story, is like when 20, almost 20 years ago, when I was fighting stage four cancer, um, chemotherapy destroys your immune system. If I had gotten a cold after six months of that, if I had gotten the flu, I would have likely died. It would have been a high probability. But back then, like in the old days, I never ever thought that I'm going to force the city to shut down so that I can go out and live my life. But there's sort of a socialization of responsibility where people no longer have to worry about whether or not they're they're maintaining their weight, which is a comorbidity. Sorry, it's true. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think they're setting us up for something right. They've socialized health responsibility and the slippery slope there is, yeah, is ominous. It's very it's very ominous. And I think that maybe there was a little more reason to do that before there was a vaccine available. It, maybe not necessarily restrictions, but in terms of considering other people's health. Because if there's, in a world with no vaccine, right, like my choice to go up next to you maybe does potentially, uh, whether I social distance or depending on the, the kind of mask, whether I wear a mask. But in a, I said this right when the vaccines became widely available. Take it or don't. That should be your choice. But then there's literally no externality anymore. If you were arguing that on that mm-hmm. basis, everyone should make the choice to take it or not. And then let anyone go back to normal. Because if you've and this sounds a little a crass because it is still tragic. But if you choose to be unvaccinated, you choose to have untreated or un um, health issues that make you more at risk, like obesity. Um, and then you get covid and die when you had those options. That is not that is sad. But that is ultimately nobody's responsibility except your own. That is something you chose a risk and it didn't work out. And that's very unfortunate, but you cannot use that as a basis to try to infringe on other people and confine them to their homes and make them cover their faces in public. We have it all twisted when we are removing any sense of personal responsibility from the question of health, and the, especially because the vaccines have made us been able to basically internalize it, right? Mm-hmm. Any problem that did exist, maybe making it a little murky, for me, went out the window once that choice became available to people. Well, and I want to be clear, as a person who's a capitalist and as a person who's a Christian, I think about this a lot, because while I think the government has virtually no role in any of this, and any kind of mandate, any kind of lockdown was wrong from the very beginning, 
as somebody who wants to actually live out my values and actually attract other people to them, both from a religious and a political sense, I do feel a responsibility to be a good citizen and to take into account other people's health and to take into consideration things I can do to make the world better. The problem with all of this is that it's very anti-science, first and foremost. There is actually no indication that doing any of this makes anybody safer than you yourself. And, and there should be personal responsibility here. If you want to be safe, if you want to increase your likelihood of surviving this, there are a set number of things you could do, and a set number of those things you could do long before the vaccine. You could work out. You could focus on getting your weight under control. You could take vitamin D. There were a lot of good things that were happening even before the vaccines, but certainly once they came into play, Brad and I both taking the vaccine. We both talk about it. We both talk about how it wasn't scary and it's fine. And we both are glad that we're going to have milder cases of COVID or he already did. I have not had COVID as far as I know. Um, but we know that we won't probably go to a hospital or die. But if I chose not to, it's the same as me choosing to not buckle my seatbelt, right? That's silly. And you should. And I've lost a cousin to that very factor. But it was her choice. And that is every individual's choice to protect themselves, keep themselves safe. And the fact that we keep trying to pass that on to others is misleading. It's very misguided. I think we've given people bad information, which is really, I said at the very beginning of the pandemic, that's the government's only role in this is to actually give people valid information they need to guard themselves boy, and keep themselves the well. Time. And boy, have they felt at that. Talk about misinformation. They have gotten virtually everything wrong. Right. So at the end of the day, I think that we do have that responsibility as Christians and capitalists to, to Go, go the extra step of our own volition and look out for other people and try to be a good citizen. But that is in stark contrast to the government forcing you to do that. And, and additionally, I don't think we've seen any indication that jumping through all these hoops would actually even ultimately do so that So I others. saw a Babylon Bee headline today where it says, Joe Rogan agrees to only spread <laughs> CDC-approved misinformation. Yeah. And so yeah. you're definitely onto something. And the, the only thing I'll say, right, is like, to the extent that there is any role of government, it's like to stop people from violating other people's rights. Like my right to swing my fist ends where your face begins. And a government making that illegal is what government exists to do. The idea that government exists to make better decisions about your health for you starts with Michael Bloomberg in New York City and a soda size, but then it ends with barring people from the public unless they make the uh, correct uh, medical decisions, telling them they can't go in restaurants and coffee shops because they're unclean or they're dirty and they're contagious potentially, even though, like you said, that's not really how the science works there. So that's why you're onto something with this inversion, and it's really problematic that we need to push against. So I'm, as a radically red-pilled libertarian, I'm, I'm going to say that the, the problem with government intervening in anything is that they suck just as bad at the things that are really important, but the consequences are, are far more um, um, momentous and, and perhaps tragic. And I think, I think the um, public health industrial complex is ultimately going to be judged in, in a catastrophically damaging way for what they've done to us during this. And, and I think Rand Paul is right. And I, I think that we are going to discover. Um, I'm, I'm sure you saw the meta analysis from Johns Hopkins, right? Yeah. yeah. About how the, they looked at all the studies about lockdowns and showed they had little to no effect, but massive consequences. And of course, you immediately saw the establishment try to nitpick the study and melt down over it. But there's going to be a reckoning. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what they're freaked out about. So tell us um, when when the government and their, their tech um, uh, conspiracy conspirators shut us all down. We're all going to base politics. How do we get there? So it's base-politics.com. Uh, that's the website. You can mm -hmm. sign up for our email list. And then the podcast, Base Politics, is on Apple. It's on Spotify. But it's basically wherever you get. So it's on a bunch of different options. And you can also listen to it directly on the website, uh, which is base-politics.com. Then we're still on all the social medias, Brad Palumbo, Hannah Cox, for now, um, so people can connect with us on there. But I ideally, the idea is that we bring people in from these platforms to the website, they sign up for the email list. Be I think we're much further removed from like email servers deleting people, and, and we even Amazon Web Services did that once to Parler, but that's still very rare, whereas social media purges are happening all the time. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to take our existing social media audiences and new audiences bring them to the website where we can connect directly with them and cut out the middleman. And Hannah, your job is to keep Brad from like embracing too much government because that's right. I'm holding he's, down he's the fort over here. He's, he's a, little a little to the right of me. Brad and I often joke because people think that Brad is far more conservative than I'm far more libertarian. We actually only disagree on about three or four issues. And even then it's not like 
a night and day difference. I just am probably a little bit more to the libertarian side of an argument like immigration. And he's pro-immigration, but would have like some more controls on it than I would. So we're actually very similar. But this is why I think this is important. People are increasingly going to independent journalists. They don't trust organizations. They don't trust actual institutions and the mainstream media anymore for very good reason. They want to hear from independent journalists. And, and I think that we've been able to cultivate great followings and audiences through that. And, and combining forces, we're able to kind of combine. And he tends to do a lot of outreach to the right. I tend to also outreach to the right but I also talk to the left a lot because I've done a lot of work around civil liberties and so I have a lot of leftists who are in my audience who are like libertarian curious I would say and and I think by, by coming together we're able to really create what I think can be the future big tent of the right which should again be grounded in the values we've always espoused but the right has not always actually lived up to which are free market capitalism and civil liberties you know. and yeah. limiting the government and so we're really excited we've got a lot of young um, authors we're excited to hopefully bring in in the near future and I think that we'll continue to grow and grow but we we think we're off to a good start we've seen amazing results from the first couple of weeks of this venture so we hope people check us out bookmark it make this your go-to in the mornings that you go and read we've, we're putting out a ton of content even though we're currently just doing this nights and weekends we've got a lot coming out that i think people will like there cool well thanks guys let's hope this episode doesn't get banned yes and well, now i have to get that uh cold brew that you said it's yeah, legendary yeah. it's it's the best <laughs> thanks guys